I think we'll get started. Usually one or two still come in shortly after six, but we'll get going. So uh, it's a great pleasure to see you again, uh, welcoming you to the 12th in our series of conversations. I'm Dietrich Neumann, director of the John Nicholas Brown Center. And as you know, this series is has two goals, really. One is simply to bring artists, writers, thinkers, musicians, um, and others together with different publics from Providence for an exchange of ideas. And uh, second, we're eager to make this house as open to the public as possible. I want to mention, I think, Kathy, uh, you know, we've had 12 events now, and this is a new thing, and we hope to, it goes into very high numbers. Uh, we'll, but I think Kathy wins the award of having been to pretty much every single one, except the first one, right? So <laughs> you, you win the prize. So wonderful. Thank you for that. So uh, as you know, the speakers have been mostly local. and. Uh, what they have shared with us speaks to the vibrancy of our amazing city. Next week, we'll have the last one before Christmas, Howie Snyder and Islay Taylor of the Steelyard, that you know, amazing community organization. Today, we have with us Brett Smiley over here, who, as you all know, is running for mayor of Providence. I should say right at the beginning um, that, of course, we have invited everyone who is running for mayor um, to speak in this series. Some have already accepted. I think Gonzalo Cuervo is coming in our lineup for next semester and uh, um, others are, you know, will join us a little bit later. And Bridget, who greeted you at the door, is the one who is in charge of the lineup. And we are already all set for the entire spring series, which is great. So um, uh, Brown, as you all know, is a nonprofit organization. And so we have certain rules. It's very important that we emphasize that this event is not a campaign event. Uh, there's no will be no fundraising or asking for volunteers or votes and it's also not an endorsement but rather it's a chance to get to know and hear from Brett as a citizen rather than as a candidate to hear about his ideas his vision and love for our city uh, Brett came to Providence in 2014 I think that's correct I hope roughly 2000 yeah 2005 oh 2005 oh yeah. I was going over your CV so <laughs> but you came from Chicago right which which I somehow imagine uh, must have been quite a culture shock, but uh, uh, you went to St. Uh, DePaul University and uh, he received a finance degree there and an MBA and then started a successful public affairs development and compliance firm. And so uh, despite coming from this great city of Chicago, you fell in love with Providence as others have, myself included, and uh, uh, you love our amazing art scene and the restaurants and uh, the vibrant neighborhoods and the rough charm of our city and, and its inhabitants, if I may, that um, uh, then you were hired by Mayor Jorge Lorsa uh, as the chief operating officer in City Hall. And then a little bit later, you moved up the hill uh, to work for Governor Raimondo as chief of staff and director of administration, in particular during the state's robust response to COVID-19. And that was a position he held until March 2021 when, as you all know, Governor Raimondo uh, was called to Washington to become the 40th US Secretary of Commerce. Brett is active in a number of nonprofit organizations, community groups, and causes, including Planned Parenthood, for which he raises funds and provides strategic counsel. He has also been deeply involved with Marriage Equality Rhode Island, Rhode Island Housing, Rhode Island Communities for Addiction Recovery Efforts, and the National Gay and Lesbian Victory Fund. He lives on the east side of Providence, not far at all from here. You could almost walk uh, uh, through campus actually to go home uh, with his husband, Jim DeRentis, that uh, whom uh, many of you might know, a real estate broker and former community banker. And both Jim and Brett are avid runners and share a deep love of Providence. Please help me welcome Brett Smiley. Thank you, Dietrich. And good evening, everyone. It means a lot to me that you're here on the day of our first snow. That's, uh, it wasn't much of a snow, but in Rhode Island, the lightest dusting seems to change behavior dramatically. And, uh, and, and thank you for that kind introduction. I think, uh, like a lot of people that I've met along the way, uh, I'm largely in Rhode Island because I married a Rhode Islander. And when you marry a Rhode Islander, there's really only one option for where you're going to live, and that's Rhode Island. So uh, 15 years later, we are very happily settled. And it's fun to be here uh, in this historic home. Uh, we live not too far from here in a home that was uh, one of the Lippitt's homes. And so uh, uh, the, the really rich history of the city 
uh, and complicated history, but, but rich history of the city is uh, inspiration daily. Uh, what I thought I would start with is kind of where I left off in my public service. Uh, as some of you, it's funny, a lot of people recognize me more with the mask than without the mask, because for uh, the first year of the COVID crisis, I was on stage with Governor Raimondo uh, through the state's response. And I was going to reflect a little bit on some of the lessons that I learned and the governor, then Governor Raimondo learned uh, through the early days of that crisis and, and extend some of those lessons into the challenges that are facing our city and, and how they might be instructive to meet some of those challenges. And then finally, what I think are the bright opportunities for our city as we look into the future, because I think this could be a decade or two of tremendous growth and potential for Providence. And I'm really excited about the years to come. So, we're winding now almost two years, amazingly. Um, in uh, January of 2020, I had served as Governor Raimondo's chief of staff at that point for four years, it was her longest serving chief of staff. It's a, it's a really difficult job uh, that started with early morning phone calls and usually late night uh, events or meetings with legislators in particular. And, and I was ready for a bit of a change and frankly was getting a little burnt out uh, in what was a highly political role for the governor. And the state director of administration at the time was a guy named Mike DBAs, uh, who had just taken a position as executive director of the Rhode Island Public Expenditure Council, which is a business backed group advocating on business issues. And he was a friend of mine and a, obviously a close friend of the governor. And, and what I'm particularly passionate about uh, personally, is running government and running government better. And, and in Rhode Island, the director of administration's job is exactly that. It's the back office for all of state government. So it's HR, it's IT, it's state facilities, uh, labor relations, uh, and the budget office, kind of all the things that uh, may be unique about me and a few others in life uh, get very excited about and most people uh, have no interest in. But uh, the governor asked if I would go serve in that role, and I was particularly interested in uh, streamlining government, putting a bunch of services online, making it easier to interact with state government, and, uh, and had a, a, a bright and bold uh, action plan for my time as DOA director, which was a real um, honor in my career, and I was very excited about it. Two weeks after my confirmation, uh, we got our first COVID case in Rhode Island, and all the things that I had planned to do uh, got thrown out the window, and, and that year turned out to be very different. And so as we think about the early response to COVID and some of the things that we did well and some of the mistakes we made, because we did both, uh, I tried to spend some time this week in preparation thinking about what worked and what didn't work and, and how that can be instructive for future leaders, both at the state level and at the city level, as I think about my next move. Um, the most important thing is while leadership matters in government, uh, particularly in the executive branch of government, uh, the leader, him or herself, is not enough. They need to have a strong team. And what Governor Raimondo had done, I think, so well was recruit, retain, cultivate talent in state government. And that team was in place before the crisis hit. Uh, public service, particularly in a place like Rhode Island, where complaining about government is one of our pastimes, is a, is a tough job. Uh, we don't pay particularly competitively. Uh, the benefit structure is antiquated. And your mistakes are often front page news. And, and so it's hard to attract good talent to work in public service. And yet she was very good at it. And we had a team in place that was highly competent and had been working together for years so that when the stuff really hit the fan, we were, we were already uh, cohesive as a, as a team. And we had people who were prepared to pull all the levers of government in the right way um, when the moment hit. And so I think that that sense of having a strong team and being relentlessly focused on talent in government uh, is one of the most important things that any executive in government can do. Uh, additionally, as you may recall <laughs> at the time, uh, the lack of information and at times disinformation that was coming out of the federal government uh, made it very difficult on states. Um, the Trump administration at the time had no interest in, at the beginning, acknowledging that there was a major crisis. And then as, as it went forward, I think it was a bit of a deflection 
or a lack of competency at their level or a combination thereof. But, you know, the president and his team kept on saying, well, it's up to the states to decide. It's up to the states to decide. And so we had to work hard to collaborate with other units of government and particularly other governors. Uh, and so I had built a relationship at that point, and it really ended up being a great advantage that I had been our chief of staff for years in networking with and, and, and building real relationships with the other chiefs of staff, particularly in the region. And the governor had had a terrific relationship with the other governors in the region, particularly Governor Lamont and Governor Baker in Connecticut and Massachusetts. And we started to try to make decisions as a region. And because there was no guidance coming from the federal government, it was really up to us to try to establish some standards, to share what was working, what wasn't working. If you remember early on, we were scrambling for ventilators. Everyone thought that you needed to be uh, treated with a ventilator, which turned out to not be entirely true. In most cases, it was in fact not the need, but we were coordinating bulk purchases. There'd be leads late at night on a manufacturer in Miss Michigan, maybe. And so uh, that collaboration between the governors and the idea sharing and the uh, willingness to just kind of put any competitive ego aside to just work with your colleagues, and particularly Governor Baker, who was a Republican, and the rest of us were all Democrats, um, really paid dividends. And the, the collaboration amongst government, which doesn't always work particularly well in a crisis, was critical. The other piece of that that was really important was the collaboration within government within Rhode Island. And uh, if you follow politics or government in Rhode Island, you know that there's often conflict between the governor and the legislature. And, uh, and we were able to set all of that aside after what had been several rocky years, uh, particularly with the House Speaker at the time, uh, to, to all row in the same direction. And so um, that spirit of collaboration and of response to a crisis and of putting the public first, uh, despite any past political rivalries, was, was critical. Um, Next was a, a, a real collaboration with the private sector. You know, Rhode Island, and it's some of our challenges that we don't have a lot of major corporate uh, headquarters anymore. In many cases, you know, the, the big banks, uh, some of the other major industry of the past manufacturing are either smaller players or the regional office of uh, a big bank, but we were so fortunate to have a couple significant and most importantly, probably CVS's presence here because their willingness to partner with us um, was critical and they ended up being a key testing partner. You know, they were manning our testing sites. Um, the governor had had personal relationships with a couple technology partners that, you know, we've heard, I'm sure you've all heard this promise of oh, Rhode Island so small, it should be perfect to pilot certain ideas. That promise seems to rarely get met, uh, but through the crisis it was. We did a partnership with um, Salesforce, which is a major customer resource management CRM software. They're the ones that ended up actually building the software for our contact tracing. They did it in Rhode Island for cost, and then they ended up selling it elsewhere, which was part of the agreement and fine for us. Rhode Island taxpayers got a significant benefit from uh, not paying any markup, and we were first in the nation to roll that out. We also, uh, a couple of years ago, had attracted a new business called Infosys, which is down in the old Providence Journal building. And, uh, and Infosys, uh, which is an Indian-based global technology company, uh, had opened up a coding office here in Providence. And they, you know, knocked on the door and said, how can we help? We want to try new things. You know, and this is kind of one of these things that I, we don't regret having tried, but it was a bit of a failure. If you'll recall early on, we had a, an app called the Crush COVID app, uh, which was, you were meant to log your health symptoms. And there was this promise at some point that there was going to be, I'm not a technologist, but a kind of a near field communication whereby if someone with whom you had a close contact tested positive, you that the technology would notify that you were a close contact. It didn't end up working out particularly well. Um, it was kind of better ventured than, uh, than implemented, but uh, it didn't cost the taxpayers anything because it was all uh, development, you know, using our data, but but uh, at no cost to taxpayers. Uh, but those partnerships in, in the private sector were critical. Government can't do it alone um, in a public health crisis or really kind of in any major uh, public safety crisis. I think government is a central and important player, uh, but we can't do it solely alone. And the CVS partnership in particular uh, was critical. And then finally, and most importantly, was just the constant communication. Uh, to communicate frequently and honestly 
the daily press conferences moved to weekly conference press conferences and then occasionally back to daily press conferences. Uh, and there is a real tendency, I think it's a, a human nature tendency, but it's certainly true in, in public service to paint a rosy picture. Uh, or to say that things are better than there are. And that is a critical mistake that uh, I think we, for the most part, avoided, which is it's better to, uh, to set the bar kind of low in terms of what our expectations were and then to see progress faster than, than articulated as a way to keep public engagement. Because uh, once you lose confidence amongst people, you know, a lot of these public health rules were... Uh, based upon people's willingness to go along with them and desire for a clear orderly direction and without a whole lot of rule of law behind them. And so um, maintaining that confidence and trust was critical. I thought about these as a, as a jumping off point for the challenges facing Providence into the future because we do have some significant challenges. Uh, the mayor and Providence can't do it alone. A team is also necessary. The, the mayor said strategic direction outlines a vision, but it's 4,000 employees and city government every day who actually make sure that the streets get plowed, that potholes get fixed, that students get to school on time. And, uh, and right now, I think that there is, uh, as we get to the end of the Lord's administration, it's no one's fault, but you know, it's term limited, people start looking for their next job, and there are key vacancies and weaknesses in the team that will be a key priority of mine to fill because strong departmental leadership, and particularly leadership who understands public service, um, we have the vast majority of city employees are unionized. And our public sector unions are in many cases good partners. And many of our city employees have been there a long time and enjoy the work that they do to serve the public. But you need to know how to work with unions and, and attracting and retaining good talent. And the city's pay scale is even lower than the state's pay scale. So we often uh, have a second tier pool of candidates. And so there's important work to be done. Um, Collaboration with non-governmental and, and private sector partners is also critical. Uh, we sit here today in a Brown University building. Uh, you know, I sometimes say somewhat flippantly, but for but for Brown and RISD, Providence is Bridgeport, and and so our our institutions of higher learning, our medical system, our hospitals are in, really critical to to our economic vitality, and and they're also key partners in our success going into the future. We cannot succeed without them and they cannot succeed without us either. And so there's a partnership there that I think uh, needs to be reinvigorated and renegotiated. And in a little bit, I'd like to talk about uh, some of the negotiations that are to come in terms of the, the agreements between the colleges and the, and the city. Um, the alignment between governmental partners is equally critical, just like we had uh, tangles in the past in the governor's office with the legislature. The relationship between the Providence City Council and the mayor's office has been contentious in the past. Uh, and at its worst, it can grind progress to a halt. Uh, so having a council and a mayor who can work collaboratively to get things done is critical. Uh, back in the Cicilline administration, following the Cianci tenure, uh, the city passed term limits for the first time. There didn't used to be term limits on, for either council people or for mayors. So just like Mayor Lorza is term limited this year after serving two four-year terms, the city council was limited back then for the first time ever to three four-year terms, a total of 12 years of service, which took effect the following election. So it's taken 14 years for some of our long-term council people to reach term limits. And so in the next election, there's 15 city council people in Providence. In the next election, six of them will be term limited. In addition to the fact that there's already one new person because council president at the time, Matos, is now the lieutenant governor. Uh, and then a little, so almost half of the city council uh, will be brand new, which is both an incredible opportunity, but also a bit of a risk. There's institutional knowledge there that's, that's leaving. And I would hope and encourage, uh, while I'm uh, excited to be a candidate for mayor, I would encourage everyone to please engage in council races as well for whoever your uh, council district is. Uh, it's something that doesn't often get a lot of attention. In many districts, the uh, voter participation is quite low. Uh, there was a special election for Councilwoman Matos's seat 
a couple of months ago, and uh, I think the winner won with 250 votes. Uh, it's, uh, it's very small. And those 15 members of the city council are responsible for passing the city budget, all city ordinances. Uh, they can either uh, throw significant sand in the gears of progress, or they can be real, real, real partners in progress. And so uh, that's a, a critical uh, opportunity for the city, but also something, a really important lesson that I would take into city hall. Uh, and then finally, back to that, that central point about honest and, and frequent communication. There are some big challenges facing our city and, and the mayor and the council will need to articulate those honestly to, to, uh, to the residents of Providence. There are no silver bullets for a lot of these solutions and there are no easy answers to most of these challenges. And so honest and fair and reasonable communication around them to help explain as best as possible. I think back to when Governor Raimondo uh, was Treasurer Raimondo and the state was contemplating pension reform uh, for a state pension system that was on its way to insolvency. And she endeavored in a statewide tour called Truth in Numbers, uh, which was as best as she could manage a non- with no spin on the ball, no pejoratives, no pointing fingers, but just math really explaining the problem at hand and the various options. Uh, and I think to his credit, Mayor Lorza and before him, Mayor Tavares have started to explain some of Providence's pension problems similarly, uh, but that day of reckoning continues to come sooner and sooner. Uh, and, and I think that that is actually the biggest challenge facing the city. Uh, to, to pivot into some of these challenges. I was on an interview the other day and somebody asked me if I could wave a magic wand, what's the one thing I would fix in Providence? And, and my answer to that question was to fully fund the Providence pension system. And, and I say that not necessarily because my top priority is ensuring a stable retirement for thousands of public employees, although I do wish that for them. And I say that not because in the I've now knocked on over 6,000 doors in Providence. And of those 6,000 doors, probably less than 10 of them have asked me about the pension system. Uh, but the things that people do ask me about, fixing their sidewalks, repaving their streets, better police protection, higher quality schools for their kids, all cost money. And the single biggest driver of why the city doesn't have funds to make those investments is because of our pension system. So a little bit of overview of where we stand. The Providence pension system is currently about 25% funded. We have uh, assets of about $300 million and an unfunded liability of about 1.1 billion. Now of that 1.1 billion, there's what actuaries are called the normal cost, which is the, what you have to pay every year for your current employees and their future benefits. So if we had a fully funded pension system, we would pay just the normal cost. That's like paying healthcare every year, $10 million. The annual payment's $110 million. So the $10 million is, is the cost of our current employees. $100 million is actually paying down the debt from the past. And that debt was incurred in the mid nineties uh, for really for two reasons. One, uh, the city skipped its payment for several years uh, in the Cianci years. And in the Cianci years and then going into the Palino years, we agreed to a benefit structure for certain employees that was unaffordable the minute that it was signed, uh, such that retirees were making more and in some cases double in retirement than what they made while on the job a shocking giveaway. Uh, and then like making your minimum credit card payment every year, if you skip a couple payments, you never get out of that hole. And so we have $100 million every year that we pay that just goes to pay for the sins of the past. And, and were we to be publicly uh, fully funded, we would have $100 million in free cash every year. Now, when you take out the school budget, the majority of which is passed through money from the feds or from the state, the city's budget's about $500 million. So that's a 20% increase of available funds to invest in all the things that we would want to invest in. Um, so that is, in my opinion, the largest challenge facing the city and, and the biggest task awaiting the next mayor. When Mayor Tavares was mayor, he passed uh, pension reform about the same time that then Treasurer Raimondo did. 
Um, his negotiations with the unions resulted in a 10-year freezing in what they call COLAs or cost of living adjustments. And so the benefits did not increase for 10 years. That 10-year agreement was struck in 2013. That expires in the first year of the next mayor's term. Uh, and so we will need to be back at the table for round two uh, of pension negotiations with the city. I believe that we should get out of the local pension business. There is no reason for Providence to maintain its own fund. We should negotiate with the state to get into the state system. Uh, we have regular and recurring cash flow problems in Providence. Uh, when you have a benefit uh, fund of only $300 million and we pay out just under $100 million in benefits every year, we make our payment once a year in the summer, we pay it out monthly to retirees. They get their check every month. We keep a disproportionate share of our, our money in cash because we need the cash flow. We earn no money on that money. We should be in the state system. We pay our own advisors. We pay our own lawyers. We pay our own bankers to all get the same advice that the state gets. There's no reason for it. And then we should negotiate with the state uh, to allow us to buy in over time uh, and, and to see what we can do uh, on the benefit structure in exchange for this promise to retirees, who I feel bad for, by the way. The retirees did everything that they were supposed to do. The deductions came out of their check every two weeks. It's the politicians of the past that didn't make the payments. And so uh, it's important to kind of continue to acknowledge kind of who's responsible here, but we need to get to a place where it's sustainable. The other major opportunity from a financial standpoint, uh, but also a challenge, are these pilot agreements with the colleges. And so in, when Mayor Cicilline was mayor, not too far from here, in front of the Van Winkle gates, you may recall, he had a press conference, plopped his, uh, his uh, podium in front of the gates and had a uh, press conference calling on then President Ruth Simmons to negotiate with the city of Providence because Brown made no payments to the city. Uh, they struck a deal, which the other colleges then followed, uh, which was the first payment in lieu of taxes to Providence. That was a 20-year deal reached in 2002. That expires at the end of next year. Another major significant re uh, renegotiation that needs to occur uh, with the next mayor. Uh, there was a lot of press recently actually in New Haven, uh, just like Brown, the Yale endowment has done fabulously well over the last couple of years. And Yale made a significant uh, additional investment in New Haven that faces some very similar financial uh, challenges uh, as Providence does. And so I think there's a real opportunity to renegotiate with the colleges and the universities in the years to come. The other important player in that is our hospitals. You know, our hospitals are nonprofits. They also don't pay taxes to Providence. Uh, for all of us who are property taxpayers in Providence, by the way, um, city government is funded almost entirely on property taxes. In Providence, over 40% of the land now is tax exempt. Between the colleges and the hospitals, over 40% of the land in Providence is tax exempt. And, and so that burden to fund government shifts onto the 60%, onto all of us. The hospitals in particular, Brown and, and Johnson and Wales too, uh, but the hospitals in particular have gotten into the commercial property game. So if you're down around Rhode Island Hospital in South Providence, there are many uh, office buildings full of profit-making doctor's practices that are owned by Lifespan. They don't pay taxes on those buildings. Those are commercial properties. If you go to the University of Orthopedics across the bay in East Providence, that pays property taxes. It's a for-profit profit-making doctor's office. And so uh, I think we should start the conversation with the nonprofits around uh, what I call non-mission buildings. Uh, and actually, when working for the governor, I was able to insert into the state budget a provision where non-mission buildings owned by nonprofits were no longer tax exempt. Uh, the lobbyists for those entities were able to take that out of the state budget, uh, but I still think it's the right path to go down. If you're Johnson & Wales and you own a Starbucks in the jewelry district, you should pay taxes on it. If you're Lifespan and you own an office building, of doctor's practices, you should pay taxes on it. It's different than asking colleges to pay taxes on classrooms and libraries or hospitals to pay taxes on operating rooms or recovery rooms. But in so much as they have continued to expand, all of these institutions have continued to expand into just commercial property holdings 
And by the way, I don't necessarily begrudge them if they want to try to control their future and their destiny and their growth plans. But so long as they're using it for commercial purposes with rent paying tenants, there's no reason that they should have an advantage over other businesses and continue to shift the burden onto all of us. Uh, the other major challenge facing our city is the stalled state takeover of the public schools. Uh, if uh, the province public schools have been failing for quite some time, and, and mayors have, I think, have all been well-intentioned to try to make changes, but those changes have all been incremental. Uh, and particularly when it comes to labor negotiations, the way it works is you sit down at the table with the folks from the teachers union in this case, with the contract in the middle of the table and they wanna add things, usually the city wants to subtract things and, and you end up with a, an iteration on the current contract and it's marginal incremental change that occurs. And the, the state of our schools are such that I think, and the former governor thought that we needed more than incremental changes. We needed dramatic changes to change the outcomes for families and students in this city. And so uh, two years ago, the state took over the province public schools. Uh, and you may recall there was a Johns Hopkins report about the state of the schools. There was a whole listening tour. There was an articulation of what changes needed to be made in order to start to make meaningful progress in the schools. Uh, and I'm sorry to say that after two years, we appear to be totally off track. Uh, for not necessarily anyone's fault, but we spent a year of the turnaround figuring out distance learning and trying to teach remotely and keeping teachers and students safe. We lost the superintendent, we lost the governor. And so uh, we've got to get back on track. There has been an articulated turnaround plan. I think that we need to work hard to get that back on track. We are at the outset of a billion dollars of school reconstruction money. Uh, Treasurer Magaziner passed a significant school bond. Well, he proposed, we all passed. We all voted for a school bond a couple of years ago that's gonna transform the city schools. Um, for all of us who love historic architecture, uh, some of our school buildings are actually some of the finest buildings in our city. Uh, I'm a strong advocate for continuing to renovate and maintain those buildings as opposed to knocking down and, and starting fresh. Um, what we need to do in that construction, however, is ensure that that construction is done equitably. There is a perception that the only good schools in Providence are on the east side. We have a major problem in the city of Providence. We are a small city, 200,000 people geographically tight. There is no excuse for a student to be on the bus for an hour in this city, to be in Connecticut in an hour. And yet we have students uh, that do that because their families do what every family should do, which is to try to do what's best for their child. And so you have families that try to get into the one good program here and the one good school there. And the whole fabric around a school community and really a neighborhood starts to degrade when we don't have a high quality school at every level in every neighborhood. Whether it's interactions with community police officers, opportunities for after school learning, uh, engagement from parents in things like PTOs and PTAs, it all falls apart when you live in South Providence and your kids go into Barton Gregorian, or you live in the North End and your student uh, tries to get into the one honors program in the middle school level, which is at Nathaniel Green, uh, transportation, ability for parental engagement, and just general neighborhood cohesion all starts to fall apart. And so uh, I'm particularly focused on making sure that when we're making these investments in our school buildings, significant investments in our school buildings, that we do so with an eye towards equity and with inclusion towards our neighborhoods so that every neighborhood feels like that they've got a high quality school in their area that they can send their student to, that their student can walk to, so that parents can be engaged, communities can start to grow stronger together again. And then finally, with respect to the schools, I think it's really important that we not try to just force Providence public schools to look like Barrington or East Greenwich schools. I think that doesn't mean lowering our standards, but it means acknowledging who our students are and meeting their needs. We have a real problem in Providence with absenteeism, both teacher and student absenteeism. When you dig into the absentee data, particularly amongst high school students, a main driver of either chronic tardiness or actual missing of class, missing of school days is because our students work. 
Many of our students are expected to earn money for their families. And so they leave school in the afternoon and go to another job, whether it's washing dishes, working in the family store. And so they're not spending their evening getting ready to learn in the morning. They're spending their evening working. And so they come to school in the morning tired or late or not at all. And, and, and that's the reality that our families are facing. And we just need to accept that reality and start to change and modify our teaching strategies so that we can meet those needs and actually serve those students. Uh, when I was in state government, we started a partnership between Coventry High School and Electric Boat, where we had students with paid internships, and the paid is the important part, with paid internships at EB, where they were getting experiential learning, seeing how math and science connected to the real world, understanding and learning differently about those kind of subjects, which can be very difficult for students, and actually earning a paycheck. And by the way, when they graduated, if they completed the program and the internship successfully, they had a job offer waiting for them, a good job offer, an electric boat. Now, they don't have to take that job opportunity, uh, but, but it was another carrot to keep those students learning. We need to be looking for partnerships like that in Providence to meet the financial needs and the very real family pressures that many of our students face so that they can continue to stay engaged and learn, but also not come to school fatigued and unprepared. Uh, because that's one of the major challenges that's driving uh, some of our high school results. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that we don't still protect the jewel that is classical. Uh, classical has been the jewel in Rhode Island for a long time, and we need to continue to keep that special. Uh, but I think we need to see big programmatic changes in our high schools uh, to acknowledge where our students are at. Uh, the, finally, the final challenge I'd like to highlight before we move into a little bit less big topics uh, is some of the public safety challenges facing our city. Uh, this was a rough summer here in Providence. Uh, the proliferation of guns nationwide has not missed our city, uh, and the number of shootings in Providence is scary. Um, the, I think the overwhelming consensus that I hear from the city uh, is that we want better policing in Providence, uh, more respectful policing, uh, policing that um, is focused on those committing violent crimes and not uh, policing that uh, is causing increased strain amongst communities of color in particular in our city. Um, we've done community policing in Providence and in fact are one of the only major departments in the region that's been accredited in community policing. Um, and, and it's a, a challenging conversation for some and, and maybe we'll hit some of this in question and answer, but in order to really engage in community policing, I actually think we need um, more police because we need to get to a place where we can restore walking beats and officers on bicycles uh, and, and an opportunity to get officers out of their cruisers to actually build real relationships in the community. Uh, I think it is a point of pride that every time a new police academy gets announced, at least in the 15 years that I've been engaged in public service in, in Rhode Island, they keep announcing it as the most diverse class in history, and every class gets even more diverse from there, which is terrific progress. Uh, but we've been able, we have uh, walked back from community policing because of some of our staffing and the barrier that exists between an officer and a cruiser in a community that does not feel safer when they see an officer uh, is a real problem and we need to get our officers out of the cars, engage with the community, attending community meetings more, doing better, uh, while at the same time investing in and continuing to explore diversion programs. We just started a pilot where uh, 911 officers are trained and are now empowered to dispatch community health workers, addiction counselors, social workers, so that not every 911 call results in an officer with a weapon being deployed because we know that's not the solution. And in many cases, that's actually doing more harm than good. And by the way, when we free up those officers, they can then go respond to violent crime, which is where their attention should be facing, faced. Finally, uh, we need to continue to invest in alternatives. Uh, I think as a city, we know this, and uh, I'm proud to be in a progressive city that understands uh, that alternatives such as recreational opportunities, paid summer jobs, internships, uh, are all 
uh, as important, if not more important, uh, investments with the same public safety dollar. Uh, and the city has continued to expand those opportunities. There's been a significant investment in the last nine months in the Institute for, for the Study and Practice of Nonviolence, which runs a street worker program, which was underinvested in in years. And so we need to maintain those investments. So having highlighted some of these challenges, there are still incredible opportunities in the future. From an economic development standpoint, I think the future is bright. We don't know exactly what the future of work is going to look like post-pandemic, but what we do know is that um, some blended hybrid remote work uh, is real. And you know, I <laughs> kind of laugh now, but having gone on economic development pitches with both Mayor Alorza and with Governor Raimondo, if we were selling an out-of-state or out-of-country business, we always kind of rounded down about how close we were to Boston. We say, oh, it's 45 minutes to Boston. It's 45 minutes to Boston at 2 a.m. on a Thursday. But the uh, but you know that that connection to the the economic engine that is Boston is real. But for anyone who's ever commuted daily, it's difficult. But if the future of work is now one day a week in the office, one day a month in the office, one day a quarter in the office, we could start attracting workers from New York. Uh, and certainly Boston workers. Uh, the meds and eds economy, biotech opportunities are real. I think the 195 commission actually doesn't get enough credit. There is a lot happening down there and there's a fair amount in the pipeline that continues to develop strong. We've got a huge opportunity in the creative economy. Everyone who, all of us who know and love and live in Rhode Island, the creative economy in Rhode Island is real, it's vibrant. Uh, the arts organizations, the culinary arts, the visual and performing arts are thriving and have, have survived, thank goodness, the pandemic with significant public support, but nevertheless has survived and it provides for quality of place. I think there is an untapped market here for cultural and heritage tourism. We've got some of the greatest collection of colonial architecture. We've got amazing history in this place that we do not do a good enough job selling as a, as a destination. Uh, and, and there are opportunities there. I would like to see us connect better to the water. I think uh, if you asked 100 Rhode Islanders to name waterfront communities in Rhode Island, very few would put Providence on that list. And yet we are a waterfront community. Um, our port, which is an economic opportunity, uh, could and should do more. We need to continue to quote unquote green the port. Uh, we can do better than scrapyards. And, uh, but we also, I think, have an economic opportunity to keep it a deep water port, to make it a green port. There are some people doing some very exciting and interesting work to make this a pilot for how to have the most eco uh, ecologically friendly and greenest port in America to export that technology elsewhere. There's a whole lot that happens around emissions and discharge when a port is in is when a ship is in port. And there are people here that are working on how to idle without emissions, how to treat that discharge without polluting the bay. And that's both an opportunity for us here locally to continue to clean Narragansett Bay, but also then export that technology elsewhere. There's also a huge opportunity in the wind energy space. And there are negotiations taking place right now to continue to expand along the waterfront for the wind uh, farms that are gonna be installed up and down the East Coast. Uh, and I would love very much to see those replace the, the scrap yards uh, and instead see the assembly of big, beautiful turbines that then can be floated down the bay uh, and, and help secure our clean energy future. And then finally, the cultural amenities in Providence uh, are real. And uh, the diverse communities here, particularly our vibrant and growing Latino community, uh, provide real, real opportunities, both for um, all of us to access a continued rich and diverse city, but for others to come visit. Um, there's real investments that should take place down Broad Street so that um, I, I don't think there's enough Providence residents and particularly my neighbors here on the east side that actually spend time on the south side uh, and recognize the incredible restaurants that are down there, the rich and vibrant uh, culture in the city. Uh, we've got a thriving 
uh, Asian community. We've got a proud Black and African American community, a huge African immigrant community. Uh, there is so much diversity here that is a part of our strength that both creates talent for work, uh, but also opportunities for uh, visitors to come and enjoy what Providence has to offer that uh, it's really an exciting place to live. And it's, it's, it's encouraging to me that if you look at some of the population data from the last 10 years, there's significant inflow into our city. People want to live here, uh, but we've got to fix some of these challenges. You know, but when I think about the challenges, you know, the, the things that I talked about, the underfunded pension system, a failing school system, um, and, uh, and a, a deteriorating public safety system, other cities are dealing with this. These are not unique to us. Uh, and other cities have made meaningful progress on these fronts. And so I think about our challenges as not unique and frankly man-made. And I look at our opportunities and our opportunities are in fact intrinsic to where we are. In other cities that would want some of these things, you can't recreate them. You can't recreate a deep water port and waterfront access. You cannot recreate uh, historic architecture and the vibrant culture that we have. And so uh, in that light, in spite of these challenges, I remain hugely optimistic about the future. I think the next decade or two for Providence can be great. This is a moment that's happening nationwide for kind of what, are, what I would refer to as big little cities. And, uh, and so there's no reason that Providence can't be that world-class big little city uh, that all of us who live here, I think know and love, uh, but for the rest of the city to, to embrace. Um, for the rest of the country to embrace for those who haven't discovered it yet. So it's a delight to be here tonight. Dietrich, thank you again for inviting me. I'm happy to answer questions. I don't know how you want to uh, conclude the rest of the evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I have a question in regards to the uh, pension system yes. uh, that you discussed earlier. And <clears throat> I'm kind of curious, we have a failing pension system that you want to kind of kick the can down and phone off on the state system. I don't know how successful they are, but if the city system is failing in that regard, and it sounds like it is, what do you see as impediments uh, or, or what do you see as reasons why the state would never pick up? Yeah. So, first of all, I'm not, I'm not sure I would use the term failing. Um, it's, uh, it's on its way towards insolvency, but the, the system's working as designed. It's just underfunded. And so uh, the negotiation with the state is to allow us an on-ramp to get into their fund. And the reason that the state doesn't want to do it is because the politics are such that they say, why should we bail out Providence? The reason that the state should do it is because were the city of Providence to go bankrupt, it would... Uh, put irreparable harm on the city and on the state at whole. So I think if we go down, they go down with us. And so uh, that's why I think they should care. The Treasurer Magaziner has said that he believes that the local underfunded pensions is the greatest risk facing the state. I agree with him. Providence is not alone in our pension problem in Rhode Island. And so uh, our problem is the biggest on dollar figure because we're the largest city by far, uh, but there are multiple underfunded systems that are similarly poorly funded. Cranston has a couple funds, one of which is poorly funded. Warwick has an underfunded plan. Johnson has a significantly underfunded plan. Uh, Coventry has an underfunded plan. I think West Warwick as well. And so my proposal would be to build a coalition of distressed municipal funds and negotiate with the state to solve this problem, which is of statewide importance and also to package it as not just a Providence bailout, but rather a municipal pension fund solution so that future mayors wouldn't even be given the option of skipping payments uh, because there's no reason that some of the same bad choices that were made in the past might not be made again in the future. And so that's, that I think is the task ahead. I do believe it's of statewide importance and the, the, state fund is now almost 60% funded and does not have the same cash flow concerns such that it could absorb us to no detriment to it, so long as that we continue to buy in over whether it's a 10 or a 15 year timeline. Please. So in this scenario, if it were adopted, would the uh, state then do the negotiations for future uh, pensions with 
city employees? Potentially, uh, or at least have to sign off on benefit changes, potentially. Uh, the, Is that in, um, there are several municipalities that are already in the state system. And the in that in those communities, Central Falls, for example, when they went bankrupt, their fund got put into the state. Um, they cannot make changes to retiree benefits without state sign off. Sure. <laughs> yes. You were talking about um, public safety funding, saying that there's more police officers. Yes. At the same time, you said that the city should reallocate funds to recreational programs and nonviolence programs. That seems a little bit like a contradiction. If I said reallocate, I apologize. I didn't mean to say reallocate. I think continue to invest in is, is what I would have meant to say. Um, we are currently at about 400 police officers, uh, uh, of which another 100 are retirement eligible. And uh, the chief of police, who I think is a terrific leader, um, has said that he believes he needs 450 officers to properly staff the city. Uh, I'm willing to take his advice uh, on that staffing level. Uh, the, additionally, by the way, every time there's a retirement because of our success in recruitment and training and uh, continuing to change the face of the province police department is an opportunity. Um, uh, but the investments in alternatives, the rec centers, summer jobs programs, paid internship opportunities, uh, alternatives such as the Nonviolence Institute all of those uh, investments need to be need to be made in concert together, uh, and so I don't think it's an either or. I think it's a both. Thinking of support for the arts, of course. Mm. And, uh, I mean, obviously, the province is famous for having a vibrant arts scene and a really good place for artists who come out of town. Obviously, many stay here. Now, remember, uh, Mayor Cianci had a program where he supported artists getting loft spaces downtown mm. right and they had long been support for yeah. water fire given the problems that you laid in front of us that the city faces do you think that support can continue under any future mayor or even be increased what's your take on yeah i think it needs to be increased i mean the the city actually doesn't provide particularly robust support to the arts these days. Um, you know, our, our, our local artists kind of survive on their own. Um, the, the large arts organizations, which in Providence, the Philharmonic, Trinity Rep, um, Waterfire, you know, they've got a pretty diverse funding base. I think they're critical to our economy and are worthy of our support. Uh, and then the, the more, I don't want to say underground, but the more avant-garde artists, the smaller uh, individual makers, um, you know, the, you point, I think you hit on the key there, which is the direct government support is not necessarily um, something we have a tradition of, uh, but continuing to make this a place where artists can afford to live and work and do their work uh, is critical. Uh, and we didn't talk about housing at all tonight, uh, but the the housing crisis that's underway is particularly impactful on the arts community. Uh, you know, I know quite a few, particularly visual artists, who make their work here but sell it elsewhere because they can they can just get higher prices in New York and elsewhere. Uh, but they make it here because there's a community of artists, but it's also an affordable place to live, and certainly more affordable than Manhattan or Brooklyn. And so, um, continuing to ensure and protect. Um, things like artist communities and community living arrangements and live workspaces are really critical. Uh, I think one of the most exciting kind of, uh, and you're, I saw you said you have Howie coming from the Steelyard next, next week. Um, well, I think one of the most exciting geographic regions in the city right now is the Valley District and the things that are happening down around the Steel Yard and where Farm Fresh is. Uh, and, and it's a really fabulous. I was over at the... Um, the pizzeria next door and the brewery the other night, which has concerts at night. And it's like, it, it is the next ha happening neighborhood and that's gonna continue to develop. There is a significant, it's the Nicholson File Company, which is a couple doors down, which is full of artists and makers. Um, and, uh, and I think it's critical that we protect buildings like that to allow it to 
continue like it is. They're going to need some money, I think, for fire fire code upgrades and things like that. But to continue to make that an affordable place for live workspace for artists and makers and creators uh, is really, really important. Um, some of the gentrification that happens in the city doesn't just displace families, but it, it displaces our artists. And uh, and that is part of our DNA here and it's part of our, our competitiveness. And so uh, as we think about housing policy in the city, uh, you know, that's those are places where, uh, you know, we subsidize affordable housing regularly. Uh, and generously, uh, and and there's a lot of money flowing to that right now from the feds and from the state, uh, and we need to make sure that some of that finds its way into live work artist space as well, uh, to protect some of those old mills and places where artists live and, and create. Well, is there so we moved into the second half of this, which is gathered over some food and wine and you know, uh, from uh, continuing the conversation. I really liked how you laid it out by presenting the really depressing challenges. <laughs> but they're not, they're fixable. They're big, but they're fixable. And it's not, it's not, it's not depressing. They're, they're, they're serious challenges, but if we have serious people to address them, then the future is bright and wide open. I, I'm, I'm grateful for that correction. I'm, 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 I'm Thank you. Thank you.